بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وعلى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the criminal law class After we discussed the material element of the crime and after we talked about the conditions of the crime today inshallah we will discuss the issue of complicity remember we said in the material element of the crime we discussed the first issue of it which is attempted murder and whatever is related to it now we will discuss complicity joining in committing a crime sometimes an offense is committed by a single individual and sometimes many people they partake they participate they cooperate with one another to commit the crime so to what extent people are responsible or they are they are liable for this crime therefore we have four forms of complicity or participation Either you share the commission of the crime, so you and the other partner are equal, this is the first form, or you agree to share in the commission of the crime, whether you did share physically or not, you just agreed and arranged to commit it with your partner, inciting or encouraging the accomplice to commit the crime that is the third form and then helping the accomplice without physical participation these are four different forms of complicity you either share the commission of the crime equally with your accomplice or you agree to share regardless of whether you did really share or not or you incite, you encourage the accomplice to commit the crime. You tell him you should kill this person. He is so and so, he did this and that. Or you help him without a physical participation. You drove him, you, you, you provided the weapon of murder. All these are forms of complicity. In all these forms, the partner encouraged his accomplice to commit crime, either by a physical participation in the commission or by the mere encouragement. He either participated physically or he encouraged. And nowadays, of course, we have the issue of supporting terrorism you are here and they tell you no you supported terrorism why well you said statements that will encourage terrorists to to make some actions to have the attacks now if you notice the works of scholars their books you will see that they discussed extensively with details the rulings related to the direct punishments without mentioning complicity that's why actually the issue of complicity is very important because most likely you will not find it anywhere else although he took it from the works of the scholars but you will not find it collected in one book like it is here in this book that's why it's really really important this issue the issue of complicity you 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 read the works of scholars you see the rulings of punishment, the hudud, the qisas, all these details. But what about complicity? You may not find anything. Why? There are two reasons. Because complicity is an indirect issue, an indirect role of the crime. And therefore, the punishments were not clear. Because if you want to define an accomplice 
and to what extent his role in the crime and what is his punishment, this will take very long time. While we have in the Sharia the texts about the punishments of Hudud, of Qisas, and they are firm, they are fixed. They will never be changed. And that's why those are the rulings where scholars spent most of the time because it is there, it won't change. 40 lashes, 80 lashes, no one can come and say it is more. And it is specific. Whoever committed this act, this is his punishment. Whoever committed that act, this is his punishment. It is clear. That's one reason why we don't find lots of details about complicity. The second reason, the general rule of Sharia ah is that punishment is on who? On the one who encouraged or the one who committed? The one who commits the act. But what about the one who encouraged? What about the one who pushed to commit the act? We have, we have texts in the Quran, but they talk about disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the shaitan, for instance. People on the Day of Judgment, they will complain that it's not our fault. The shaitan is the one who encouraged us. Or the elders, the leaders, the rich people and the poor people, the weak people. They, the weak will tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it is them, the rich, the powerful people. But will they be excused? No. You could, you could take lessons from those ayat. But remember, those ayat are talking about what? Disbelief. So do we apply them in the criminal system or no? To what extent? That's what we will see. So that's why in, in Sharia we have rulings about the one who commits the act. But the one who, does not, who, who encourages, the one who is indirect, we don't have many texts. And that's why you will not find clear writings. However, Scholars did not ignore totally complicity. You will still find it. As I said, here in this book, there is a great work. Lots of details about complicity. And of what they mentioned is that there are two conditions for the general complicity. Two conditions. The first one, in order to have complicity, there has to be more than one person. If only one man, mastermind, planned, committed, do we have complicity? No, he's individual. So the offenders must be, or they should be what? More than one. That's the first condition. The second condition. Defenders have to commit a prohibited act. Do we have complicity in worship, in ibadah, in, in eating? Complicity is when the act is considered an, a crime or prohibited or an offense. Okay? You cannot come to people, <laughs> just because they are sitting together, you tell them this is not allowed or you committed a crime. There has to be an offense committed. Now, first we will discuss the direct complicity. What do we mean by direct accomplice? When we have an accomplice or a partner who has an essential role or participation in that act, in that offense, this is what we call direct complicity. Like what? Three people they planned to kill someone. Each one of them carried firearm loaded with bullets. The moment they saw the victim, each one shot a bullet. And the person was 
killed. Now, there is a possibility that one shot was fatal. But how we will treat all those three people? They are direct accomplices. That's what we mean by direct complicity. Now, most jurists, they distinguish, they differentiate between accountability for crimes committed in agreement and crimes committed with concurrence. What do we mean by that? In crimes committed in agreement, every offender is responsible for his respective role which is his own part. So in complicity, we have two different types. We have concurrence or what we call premeditation, premeditated crime. What do we mean by that? It is planned and it is performed or committed equally. That is premeditated or concurrence. And then we have agreement, like you tell someone, let's go and rob this bank. Did you have a plan? Not necessarily, you just had one intention, which is what? Robbing the bank. You went there to the bank and your partner killed a police officer. In the bank, did you plan to kill a police officer? Did you kill him? Who killed him? Your partner. Who's liable? You or him? For the killing. While, what if you agreed or you planned to go and, and, and rob the bank? and you, you studied all options and your partner told you that in some cases you have to use you have to use deadly force to save your life and he tells you that's fine we will use it and then he used it and he killed someone would you be responsible for his death yes that's the difference between premeditated concurrence and encouragement or agreement. Agreement. In principle, you agreed, but you did differently. You did not have any idea of what your partner is doing. So he is responsible for his act and you're responsible for your act only. While in case of concurrence, all accomplices will have to account for the offense jointly committed by them. Okay? Let's take another example. Brawl broke up. You and your friend, you don't like that person. And you are waiting any, any chance just to attack him. And he started by attacking you with the word, abusing you verbally. So you said, that's it, and you hit him, you punched him. Your friend came and killed him. Who will be tried as a murderer? Your friend, but your friend would not do if you did not start. Did you intend to kill him? No. What if, on the other hand, you planned that brawl? And you said, whatever it takes, I want to stop him. And your friend told you, even if he was killed, you say, yeah. You went and you chopped off his hand. He killed him. You are both responsible for the murder. You see the difference? Sometimes it is hard to tell, but it is based on what? On the intention. It is based on the intention. So, jurists 
scholars, they differentiate between those two types. In concurrence or premeditating murder, you are all what? Partners. That's the opinion of the majority of scholars. But Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, says there is no difference between agreement or concurrence. In, in what sense there is no difference? What does he say? He says in both cases, you are responsible for your own action. Only. You're asked about your own action. Only. So, you know the difference between Abu Hanifa rahimahullah and the majority of scholars? And that's why, now, if I ask you about killing by reason in inheritance, would he inherit or no? Someone dug a well. So he could drink from it. And people could drink from it. Someone came, tripped himself and fall. He fell in that well and died. Abu Hanif Rahimullah says, the one who dug the well, would he inherit? Yes. Other scholars say no. Except, of course, for Imam Malik. Why they say no? Because he is still responsible. Although he did not mean to kill him, he did not intend to do that, but his action indirectly resulted in what? The death. Imam Hanif Rahimullah says no. He's responsible for, for his act. He did not do anything wrong. So, he's not deprived. Now, when we treat the offender as a direct accomplice, whenever he agrees or plans to commit the crime with his partner, whenever that was initiated, the act, irrespective of the outcome, of the action. Now, the completion of the crime, that's another stage, another level. So you cannot go to the judge telling him, I just drive that person to the parking lot. I did not go with, the, with him inside the bank and I went back. Well, why you drove him there? What was your intention? You initiated the act. So you are partner with him. Okay, so we don't look only to the act that was done by each one. We look to their intention, to the outcome. What did they do? When we want to punish them, we look at what they did. But do we say he's not an accomplice just because he did not participate? No, he is an accomplice. And by the way, this is very similar actually to the current law, to the man-made law. Sharia in that, in that respect is very, very similar to the current law that we have nowadays. Now, what is the punishment for the direct complicity? What is the punishment for direct accomplice, uh, complicity? The accomplice. In principle, that's the ruling of the Sharia. Ah. The plurality of the agents or the ones who committed the crime, it does not affect the punishment. What do you mean by this? Now, for the example that I told you, three men killed what? One person. Okay? How many victims do we have? One. Shouldn't there be one killer only? Why not? How you kill three people for one? Is that man worth three people? So why you kill three people? That's the principle of Sharia. Plurality of the agents or the accomplices does not affect the punishment. As if everyone committed it individually. 
this this crime if one did it what will be his punishment equal punishment capital uh, punishment same thing it doesn't matter how many people did it as long as they are partners and that's why we have a famous story in the time of Umar radiallahu an when he decreed that people will be killed for the murder of one and there were they were a lot many people not only one so the companions asked why you kill so many people for one person but they were all accomplices they were all partners he said by Allah if the entire city imagine if the entire city participated in killing him or premeditated to kill him I would have killed them all so it doesn't matter the plurality you are held accountable as if you are the only one so it doesn't help you to, to say there is another one did it it's not only me each one will be held responsible okay so in Islam if someone said Islam says you have equal punishment so if a man was killed the killer should be killed how you kill five people if only one man was killed where is equality here we say if one of those five by himself killed him as if five of them killed him as long as they are all partners it doesn't matter now what if two accomplices participated in the crime but each one had a different motive would that affect the punishment an example for this would be three people killing someone one of them he killed him by virtue of Qisas equal punishment because that murdered he killed the brother of that first person so he wanted retaliation and he had the authorization from the Imam to go and kill him another one killed him to steal his money and a third one killed him because he hit him how many people killed him three they came together they did not know about each other they all came at the same time and each one stabbed him and the man was killed how we treat the three are they treated differently yes what if it is premeditated but you don't know the intention of the other person you said I want to kill him and you did not tell them you have authorization from the Imam the other one said yes I want to kill him also let's plan how to kill him and the third one came and said you know I want to tell you a secret but please keep it a secret this man I hate him and I want to kill him how they are treated would the circumstances affect of each one affect the outcome what if a father killed his son and another man came helping the father killing his son how they will be treated someone came to you and he told you my son is rebellious and I want to kill him I want your help and you help him you come both together and he kills him and you help him how will you be treated by the judge who was the main factor or who was the one who initiated that the father what's the punishment for the father not capital what about the other one We could what? We could apply capital punishment. 
So the father is the one who did it or encouraged the other one and we don't kill him and we kill the other person? The principle of Sharia, again, this is the rule, is that the punishment of an accomplice is subject to the quality and intention of the agent. Quality and intention. What do we mean by quality? The status, the, the circumstances. The punishment of the other accomplice will not be affected by that. So the same act, everyone participated equally in one act, yet they may be sentenced to different timings or different punishments. That is the principle of Sharia. So, in the case of murder, the father, would the father ever be killed for killing his son? Yes or no? No. There is only one case, Imam Malik rahimahullah said, only one case. If he put him down and he slaughters him, that's the only case where it is premeditated from the father. Other than that, he's not, he's not killed. What about another person came with the father? We could kill him because the father has an excuse. He has a specific case. We don't say since the father is the main factor and he's not killed, we cannot kill anybody. No, we don't say that. We say everybody has different circumstances. So everybody is treated differently. And that's the justice of the Sharia. Now, what about causal complicity by cause? Who is the causal accomplice? And what are the conditions of the causal complicity? And that's what we need to read from the book. Open the book page 62. A cause, causal accomplice. A, ca, a causal accomplice may be de defined as a person who agrees with another person on the commitment of a culpable act or incites him to commit such an act or abets him in the commitment thereof, provided that agreement, <coughs> incitation, or abetment of his part is intentional. This is the definition of the causal accomplice. Conditions of causal complicity. From the foregoing statement, it may be inferred that there are three conditions of complicity. Three conditions of complicity. The first one, the act involved is punishable. Second... Yeah, if, if the act is not punishable, then there is no complicity here. Second, agreement, incitation, and abetment is instrumental in the commission of the act. And third, the accomplice intends to cause that punishable act. We now take them up one by one. Punishability of the act. Complicity presupposes punishability of the act and the commitment thereof. It is not necessary that the act is committed in full. In order to call the accomplice to account, the initiation or attempt of the culpable act is sufficient. Yeah, again, we don't say, oh, I did not commit the whole act. It doesn't matter. As long as you agreed, as long as you initiated, that's enough. It is also not necessary that the main culprit should be awarded punishment before the accomplice. But it is possible that the main culprit commits the offense with good intention. Thus the accomplice yeah, like how he would commit the offense with good intention? If you are defending yourself. You pushed someone because he was coming to you and you wanted to defend, defend yourself. Another one pushed him to kill him. It's the same act, pushing, shoving, but you did it for a good intention while he did not. Thus, the accomplice will be punished while the main offender or agent may get no punishment. Also, it may be that the agent is pardoned on the ground of his childhood or insanity while his accomplice will, in, <coughs> will in any case be punished. Yeah. The main person, the main agent, may be forgiven. 
Not because he deserves to, but he has a special condition. He's insane. While you are not. And you don't say, oh, I did, I did only small thing. He did the major part. It doesn't matter. Okay. In case of complicity, it is essential to agree, incite, and abet. As had um, already been seen, most of the jurists differentiate between agreement and concurrence. Concurrence means that the idea of committing the same offense occurs to several persons, but there is no agreement between them. Thus, the concurring people are not accomplices, but if they commit the concurring, but if they commit the unlawful act, they become direct accomplices or the real culprits. Agreement means that the main culprit or the agent and causal accomplice reach an understanding beforehand. Their intention should be identical and they should join each other to commit the offense. No prior agreement between the offenders, no comp then there's no complicity. If there is prior agreement on the commitment of the crime other than the one actually committed, such an agreement cannot be treated as valid. For instance, two accomplices agree to steal the buffalo of someone, but the main culprit goes and kills the owner of the buffalo or steals a buffalo belonging, belonging to somebody else. They have no complicity in the offense, but the punishment entailed by substantive agreement on the commitment of the offense is not invalidated for want of complicity inasmuch as agreement on the offense in itself constitutes an offense. Again, the intended offense must result from the agreement of the accomplices in order to involve their complicity. Okay, move to the next issue. Um, Encouraging or... Uh, cooperation? Yeah. Cooperation. A man who abets the offender agreed, agreed with him will also be deemed casual or oh, causal accomplice, although he may not have agreed with him to the commission of the offense in advance. Thus, the man who keeps an eye on the way or keeps vigil to help a killer or a thief in the commission of a crime is the abettor and accomplice of the offender. Again, one who entices the aggrieved party into the spot where the proposed offense is to take place or grabs anything belonging to the said party will likewise be treated as the offender's accomplice. Besides the person who waits in readiness outside the place where larceny is committed to help remove the things stolen by thieves, will also be regarded as their abettor. But before the time fixed for committing the offense, the man comes to know of the plot hatched against him. He goes to the person who is entrusted with the task of taking his life and attempts to kill his prospective murderer. But this fellow acts in self-defense and murders the man. In such a case, the murderer, who would otherwise have been the agent or main culprit, is not accountable because he kills his prospective victim in self-defense. Okay, we explained that. This is, I hope this is clear. Next point. We have three, three cases. You see the three conditions? Um, incitation? Yeah. Incitation. Incitation is actually designed to induce the offender to commit an offense so much so that it motivates the commission of the offense. But the situation being such that if the person induced or persuaded would have committed the offense all the, t all the same had he not been induced or persuaded. It cannot be said of him to have been motivated to commit the offense by incitation. Nevertheless, incitation in itself is punishable by the Sharia whether it produces the desired effect or not, because incitation to commit an offense is itself an offense and amounts to the commitment of an unlawful act. Yeah, someone would come and say, well, here's the thing. I just only told him, go and kill. How come you, you are here, you're coming after me? Well, what you did, was it a good thing or a bad thing? Is it a sin or not a sin? You are encouraging someone to commit a sin. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever helped doing a good thing, he will get the reward. What about helping doing an evil thing? He will be also liable for punishment without reducing the punishment of the other one. So you cannot come and say, well, I did not do anything. You encouraged and you encouraged doing something which is haram. 
That's why itself is haram. Next. The jurors differentiate between the male culprit agent and the abettor. The main culprit, according to them, is one who commits or attempts to commit an unlawful act, whereas an abettor is one who does not himself commit or attempt to commit such an act, but helps the offender by doing such acts as do not relate to the unlawful act nor can they be treated as steps taken to commit such an act. The jurists, however, differ on the question of a person who catches the victim killed by someone else. Some of them maintain that the person seizing the victim is the abettor of the killer, but does not have a direct share in the commission of the actual offense. Yeah, if, if someone is running, okay, and you see someone following him with the sword, obviously he's following him with the sword to do what? To play with him or to kill him? Kill him. You came and you held that person. The chase, the running one. Until the other one came and killed him. How you will be treated? Depending. Depending. Depending on your situation, on your intention now. Did you plan that? Did you have the intention to kill him? You did not. You just saw someone and you held him. But why you held him? If you knew that he's going to get killed. So it depends on what you are doing. Okay, next. This is the view of this is the view advocated by Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi. Some of the jurors belonging to the Hanbalite school subscribe to it. They argue that the person seizing the victim does, does have a share in the cause of homicide that the actual act of homicide is committed by another fellow and that direct commission of the act dominates participation in the cause thereof, provided that the agent does not act under duress. Other jurists, on the contrary, hold that both the person seizing the victim and the killer are the real agents. This is the view advocated by Imam Malik and some of the Hanbalite jurists. The argument advanced in support of this view is that the killer commits homicide directly while the Caesar becomes the cause of the offense and that the result of contribution towards the cause of the offense and the actual commission thereof is identical. Okay, so in this case, the case that we have someone held another person. Is he a partner, direct partner or he's a better, as you said, the helper? Okay, Imam Malik rahimahullah says, had it not been for the one who held him, he would not have been killed. While Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, what does he say? Or the third opinion that only the killer is the one who killed. Such a result could not have ensued if either of the two acts had not been committed. The jurists in reality do not differ on the question as to who is the real agent and who is the abettor. There is no controversy at all on the definition of the main culprit, agent, and the abettor. The difference arises out of the question of the application of rules as to the method resorted to in the commission of an offense, whether the mode of commission is direct complicity or ca causal complicity. The rules referred to in a nutshell are that direct complicity when combined with causal complicity takes the following forms. A, These are the three forms. First one, A. A, causation of offense dominates direct commission thereof. There, this is when the direct commission is not wrongful. For instance, when false evidence is given against the person charged with murder and sentence is passed against him accordingly. B, direct commission of offense dominates causal complicity. This happens when the commission of the offense nullifies the cause provided that the cause does not constitute, constitute coercion. For instance, a person hur hurls somebody into a river who cannot come out of it and is subsequently killed by a third person. C. Cause and direct complicity are equal and both the causal act and the act of participation If you throw someone in the river and he cannot swim and you say, it's the river who killed him, not me. Or he threw someone in the river and then he cannot come out and then he was shot. They cannot target him, he is out, out of sight and you make him available, targeted. Okay, all these are forms of, of 
direct complicity. Cause and direct complicity are equal, and both the causal act and the act of participation are of the same order for instance, compelling the agent to commit homicide. In such a cause, in such a case, the man who compels the originator of the offense and induces the offender to commit it. In other words, if the person resorting to coercion is not there, the offense would not have taken place at all. And if the agent in his turn does not commit the offense, the duress ex ex exercised by the originator would be ineffective. The jurists then differ only on the application of rules. Since the seizure causes the offense and the killer commits it, the cause and the commission thereof are combined in this case. Now the jurists who maintain that the seizure is a direct accomplice, they treat the cause and commission thereof as equal and the two acts would be of the same order. But according to those who regard the seizure as the cause of offense, direct complicity or the actual commission would get the better of the cause and the act of the seizure does not constitute direct complicity in the offense. Okay, that's enough. Inshallah, we'll stop here. Any questions?